Hi, my name is Dina DeFazio. I am an associate at Barclay Damon in the Albany office. I practice in the firm's healthcare controversies and healthcare and human service practice groups. And I am here today with Connie Cal. Connie, if you could just introduce yourself and um, your location and your title and your practice. Sure. Um, as Dina said, I'm Connie Cal. I'm also located in the Albany office. I'm a public finance lawyer and I'm the firm's deputy managing partner. Great. Thanks so much for talking with me today. Appreciate it. And just, you know, looking to record some of our experiences during this um, unprecedented time of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States and, you know, its impact on lawyers in New York. Um, I, if we could start, I was hoping we would talk a little bit about your personal experience during the COVID crisis. Um, how has this impacted you and your family? Um, you know, in some ways we've been very fortunate. You know, I'm, you know, at home with my husband and two of our adult children who li normally live in New York City, both came home. So Mike is a teacher, Mary works for a startup, and so they've been home since March. And frankly, they have never been home this month since they were in high school. So it's been, from that perspective, really great. Our oldest daughter is recently married, lives in Jersey City, and, and she and her husband stayed in Jersey City. So the hard part of that is while we FaceTime a lot and talk all the time, you know, we've only gotten to see them twice, and that's only more recently. And so we went months without seeing them. And then even the first time we saw them, we did a socially distanced picnic, and we didn't hug. And... That was very hard, you know. She's married and an adult, but she's still my baby, and so that was kind of emotionally difficult not to be able to touch her. But it's the price of trying to keep everyone safe. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I recently had the opportunity to see my cousin and her husband who live in Manhattan, and um, you know, it's this weird experience of like, I approached and said, like, can I hug you? Do I hug you? Like, what do I, you know, right. what do this is like such a weird time. Um, so yeah, it's good. I'm glad though that all of your family is doing well and um, your your kids that were in the city were able to get out. You know, yeah, for, you know, they both came home. My daughter's company closed down voluntarily a little before the executive order came out because they are a startup working in an open space. There's no walls. There's nothing. So they closed down early. My son's a teacher. He went on a little longer teaching from home. Um, we thought it might be a little chaotic with him trying to teach the three of us trying to work at the same time. But luckily we figured it out. We had a corner of the house. We usually have to touch each other and say, you're talking too loud. You're interrupting my call or my lesson plan and um, my son especially he had a bunch of middle schoolers and one time my husband and I were having a discussion about some medical issues like I can hear everything you're saying <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> so we've had a few funny moments like that yeah but. definitely I guess it brings some uh, lightheartedness to this uh you know tough time right right yeah. yeah you have to make the best of it you know We've, especially in the beginning and, and only until very recently, you know, we hardly ever, you know, out was just to go for a walk or, a, you know, exercise or something. You know, we didn't go anywhere. So, like, you know, I'm, I'm used to being on the road several days a week for work. Right. And kids are certainly used to not being home with their parents. And so trying to get everybody comfortable that, like, this is it, you know. <laughs> the big yeah. moments when we sit down to have dinner together because that's it. We're not going out to dinner or, you know. We're just home, and and that's you know it's been great, but it you know there are times and everyone I'm sure is getting a little itchy to go outside and do stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, how can you speak a little bit about how the firm's been impacted by the COVID pandemic? So, you know, it, it seems a long time ago when we first got the executive order saying everyone had to work from home which was, you know, frankly traumatic. I think lawyers have always worked from home, right? They've worked at night or they've worked on a weekend, they're on a vacation, so they're used to it. But we had staff, hundreds of people in our accounting group, our HR group, our secretaries who had never worked from home. Mm -hmm. And so fortunately we saw it coming. And so we spent a couple of weeks getting people ready. You know, we set up the whole accounting function out of Dan Lewis' home. You know, we moved any printer or hardware that we needed to into his home. 
the IT group did an amazing job. Pete Hotchkiss and his team did an amazing job getting people set up at home who had never worked from home before. So that was getting laptops to lots of people who didn't have laptops and then Wi-Fi to people who didn't have Wi-Fi. And then in the beginning, there was a million, even people who had worked from home, you know, it was slow going because the systems were also overloaded and IT was great. They set up a second VPN line, which helped immensely. And so we had that period of time where just the mechanics and logistics really um, was a great focus. But at the same time, we had to plan financially because, you know, especially at the beginning, we didn't know if we were going to go off a cliff, right? Was shutting down the country going to mean stopping of all work? Was shutting down the courts going to mean there'd be no litigation at all going on? Mm -hmm. That would mean, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of our people would be without work. And so, we spent a lot of time on the finances and mapping out various scenarios of if our revenue goes down 50%, if our revenue goes down 25%, if our revenue goes down, you know, more than that, less than that, and, and what are the possibilities? And so we, you know, took some conservative positions there in a better safe than sorry. I think one of our hardest decisions we made was to, um, temporarily cut salaries of, of everyone. First, the partners made a very large capital contribution themselves. They, they cut the amount of money that they're getting throughout the year. And then and then we turned to attorneys and staff, other attorneys and staff, and, and that was a decision that we angst about for weeks. But we felt we just had to under the scenarios. And now we're in a position where we're spending, you know, top part of every management committee meeting saying, when can we end that? Or when can we revert that? Connie? And, and, yes. Oh, yeah. Did I lose you? You froze for a second, but I'm hoping that it recorded. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so, you know, my microphone, went, home. my microphone went blue. <laughs> so can you hear me? Oh, interesting. I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My microphone is, is sort of uh, pulsing in blue now. That's interesting. As opposed to it's normally white fine. and then if I'm off, it's red, but now it's pulsing in blue. So I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means either. I can definitely hear you. And I think this is a great example of working from home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm almost glad it happened. <laughs> hey, there you go. So so that's, yeah. that's a little bit overview on the firm of what's happened. You know, we've had some clients have frozen work and said, stop, put your pencils down, no more work for us now. It's um, Other clients have said, can you do us a favor and give us a discount, a 15, 20% discount to the end of the year? Um, and then other clients have just been a little slower in paying. Just like everybody else, everyone's trying to manage cash flow because no one knows what's coming tomorrow. So we're seeing a little bit of slowdown in clients paying. Sure, that makes sense. Um, I think we, especially what you were saying about staff and being, you know, unprepared sort of for staff to be working from home is particularly interesting. I remember right when this first began, so like probably mid-March when I first started working from home, I had the occasion to like go to, I don't know, I think I was at Sam's Club or somewhere. And I was shocked because there was not a computer in the building. Right. Right. Like every laptop was sold out everywhere. Luckily, I didn't need one, but I was just like, oh my gosh. So this right. stuff to think about, right? You know, when right. You know, because most of our, you know, all of our secretaries work at the office with the desktop. And right. so many people had their own laptops, but a, quite a few didn't or didn't have laptops that really functioned at the level they needed to function. And we were fortunate that, you know, we had a bunch ready to roll out to give people updates. And instead, we, you know, reallocated them and sent them to secretaries and staff who otherwise didn't have a functioning laptop. Right. Yeah. Um, how, do, how do you think that the working from home has been going in general? I mean, in my opinion, it seems to be going pretty smoothly, but... I think from a work perspective, it has gone far better than anyone could have imagined. I, I wasn't at that much concerned about how lawyers would function, but I was like, well, how is the secretary going to function from home? How is our accounting group going to function from home? How are we going to get bills out and, and bills paid? And how's the HR going to do it? And, and people have risen to the occasion in fabulous ways. I think that our staff really has come through and, you know, I, I, I see my little microcosm, you know, I work with Aaron Kaiser, who's just a rock star. And mm -hmm. 
her level of work and communication and being the go-to person for everybody. And, and I probably, even though she sits right outside my office, I'm probably talking to her more now than I ever have because I'm constantly calling her, emailing her. Um, so I, I think it's gone well. I do think there's a human toll. I think it's one thing to voluntarily work from home because it's convenient for you. I think it's another thing when you're working from home in the midst of a pandemic. Yeah. So, you know, um, we, we've tried to encourage people to reach out to everybody in their group. You know, my small sure. group, we will call. We were doing it five days a week, but we had nothing to say to each other. But so we've gone to three days a week just to check in what everybody's doing, not just on the work front, but sort of personally, hey, how you doing? You know, what are you doing? Is, are you okay? You know, in the beginning, especially, that was so important. You know, do you have enough food? Do you have paper? Do you have this? Do you have that? Um, mm -hmm. Um, and now it's just more to just keep everyone's spirits up as, as this continues to drag. So I, yeah. I think that's really cool to all this. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, especially, you know, the, the pieces of family components, right? So like with kids at home, people have parents or, you know, other members of their family who might be compromised in some way. So there's an extra level of concern. Right. Um, people who live alone, you know, um, that's can this is a challenging time for them. Um, it's interesting. So, a lot of I think it's challenging for everybody because you just laid out probably ninety nine percent of the firm, right? People right. who have little kids at home, people who are taking care of elderly parents, people who are living alone, people who are living with people who have compromised immune systems. That probably takes ninety nine percent of the firm. You know, yeah. there's, very, there's a very rare person that's like not doesn't have that situation. So. I, I, those are all the, the cost of COVID, you know, that yeah. extra stress on people. And in some ways, you know, now that we're a few months into it, I think a lot of people are using work as like sort of a stress relief. You know, mm -hmm. at least that's the same, like getting on a conference call with a client, marking up a document, you know, working on a closing. Those are things that happened pre-COVID. So I know for myself, they, they're a little bit of a stress reliever. If I can throw myself into that, I can forget for a moment that. You know, I, I can't run to Target every five minutes to buy stuff I don't really need. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, uh, it makes for a good distraction sometimes. Right. Yeah, Unfortunately. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I know that you mentioned a little bit about the some decision making that was happening prior to the executive order. Um, I understand, in particular, from my interview with John, that you were the driving force behind the firm's reopening plan. And I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, how that process worked, um, maybe like what you folks considered, uh, the preparation that was involved. I can imagine it was a very, very heavy lift. Well, um, you know, we started thinking about it, obviously, weeks and weeks before, because we knew at some point we were going to reopen. And so we right. got together a group of people with various sort of expertise, you know, interests and expertise. So, you know, Scott Wilson's our procurement person. So, um, Pete Hotchkiss, our IT person. Peg Black, the HR person. Liz Acey and Gabe Nugent, who are labor and uh, commercial lit and labor and employment, but have big clients who they were assisting with the reopening process. And then we had Bill Cable, the Syracuse office manager, and Nancy Smith as the um, regional office director for all the offices. Jeff Keen is the COO of the firm, Paula Nash. So it was a lot of people with a lot of different skill sets. And we started by reading, you know, the CDC website, public health guidance, what the state was putting out for other businesses that were already allowed to open. We all participated in webinars. So, um, uh, Bar Association had a webinar, you know, different trade associations had webinars, and, and everybody did different webinars. And then we were meeting um, once or twice a week for hours and talking about the different pieces. And then everyone went off and did their thing. So Scott had to come up with all the equipment we needed. So we needed masks, we needed hand sanitizers, we needed the paper that you can put around door handles so that they don't, you know, the COVID doesn't attach or doesn't live as long. Um, the Nancy Smith and Bill Cable thought about offices and what we needed to do in the office. And they came up with a spreadsheet with a hundred things that needed to be changed in every office before we could reopen. You know, signs and, and getting that hand sanitizer out and, and, and 
how were we going to work conference rooms? And then my piece of it was writing the reoffering guide. So I, you know, looked at a hundred of them, you know, people, everybody was sending me reopening guides for other law firms who had already reopened in other states and um, clients and, and were very generous sharing that, our landlords. Um, and so we slowly came down to what was going to be comfortable for us. So the last decision was, how are we going to really reopen? Like the, the physical pieces we had in place, we were very comfortable, we were following best practices. But how are we going to bring people back? Or are we going to do it slowly, all at once, in teams? And then really John said one day, when I sent him a guide and I had a suggested plan for that, he goes, that's never going to work. That's not a good idea. I think we need to make it voluntary for a really long time. Just for the reasons you talked about before, people have kids at home, people are taking care of elderly parents, people have immune systems that are compromised, immune systems that are compromised, people are just as scared, are scared. And we knew that because we had done a survey, which was part of the plan. And he said, I think we should make it to the end of the year. And I really had to think about that. I didn't jump up and down and say, I think that's a great idea right away. But after I slept on it, I was like, it's the only way to make it work. Because I didn't want to be the one saying, well, your excuse isn't good enough to stay home. You have to come back. Because you didn't give me one of the reasons that I thought was good. And then you come back and get sick. And nobody wanted that. And so we had been functioning well at home. John broached it with the management committee, then with the PGLs, and everybody got on board. I mean, people need to think about it a little bit. But it made sense so that... People who really wanted to come back, and we had those people. People were calling me and emailing me, when can I go back, when can I go back, can I go back, I won't tell anybody if I go back. Um, so we have those people, and they're back in the office. We have some people who say, you know what, I'm not comfortable, or I can't for a lot of the reasons we talked about. And then we have some people who say, I want to do a little bit of each and just try it out. And so that's going well, too. People are very compliant. We have very specific rules you have to sign up on a wednesday to go in the next week and then every day you have to say are you in the office or not in the office and if you're in the office you have to answer health screening questions so lots of details and big teams um, of people working on it and we're still meeting we're we went to once a week and i think um we're going to go to two times a, a month um and then to see if we've put ourselves out of business because we're in a good place yeah i mean i think that from the perspective of uh, um, an attorney not involved in the decision making, right? I think that the decision to make it voluntary is really smart in a lot of ways. And I think it also lets attorneys make maybe what I would consider, you know, safer decisions and decisions right. are more thoughtful. So, for example, I'm one of those people who was like begging Melissa, let me go back to the office. Right? It's like, please let me go. I want to go back. I can't deal, like, I can't be home anymore. Um, but as you can see in this video, I am home right now, right? So I think the voluntariness of returning has allowed me personally to make decisions that are smarter for those around me, right? right? So I get an inkling that, like, someone I might have come into contact with has a scratchy throat, which is probably allergies and nothing, Right. But then it allows me to make a decision where I'm going to stay home. Right. Right. Off chance that, God forbid, right, there's an actual, right. right, like, and I don't want to be the one who's, like, running around the firm. So, you know, but but that's what I'm, I think the point that I'm making is, like, where I am I'm feel like I'm in a position to make more thoughtful decisions. Right. Because I'm not being forced to do something. Right. right. And everyone made it easy for us because they functioned at home. You know, right. everyone was working hard, and we knew everyone was working hard. So it wasn't like, well, you know, um, John and I do these calls once a month with um, firms across the country, and some of them are like, well, our people aren't as productive. We, we need them to come back because they're not being productive. And that's not our. That's not the case. People at Barclay Damon have stepped up and worked just as hard as they've always worked. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm. Uh, the whole time I was home, I was working like a standard day. Right, right. You know, so, yeah. And I, I think most people were. Um, you know, I think people with children, sometimes their standard day got a little disjointed. And, you oh, know, I was well, getting course, like yeah. emails at 4 o'clock in the morning from people or at 10 o'clock at night because they were getting up really early and staying up really late so that during the day they could concentrate on their kids. And 
um, one of one of the partners in the Albany office said her children have gotten very self sufficient. They're like four and six or three and six. You know, yeah. they kind of know they can you know do certain things themselves now that maybe they didn't do pre COVID when both their parents were trying to work from home. Yeah, and I'm personally a huge fan of kids, so I like really very much enjoy these experiences where I'm like you know talking to my colleagues and you know for example Brad. Um, sometimes like I'll talk to him and one of his little ones, one time she was asking to FaceTime, like, oh, can we FaceTime them? And he's like, no, we can't. <laughs> I just thought it was like the cutest thing. I mean, like this right. little, all right. She's like little. Well, um, we do, as I said, our group does these check-in calls a couple of times a weekend. Melissa Bennett's daughter, Lucy, who just turned six, um, she'll jump on the call once in a while. And like, yeah, we know it's her birthday, so we all sang happy birthday to her. Oh, cute. Yeah. One time it was Aaron's birthday, so L Melissa got all her birthday stuff out, and her kids came and sang happy birthday to Aaron. Nice. So, you know, it, I, I agree with you. Between kids and dogs, there's they're on uh, almost every call I'm on, and sometimes it's my dog. Well, <laughs> That's like an interesting my dog. way of team building, right? In a right. Exactly. And right. just seeing right. people's homes and, like, you know, things you can learn a lot from, like, what someone has on their walls. Um, right. I, 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 it's so funny because um, it has made me, I ripped down the draperies in my living room because I realized I hated them because I never come in my living room. And I certainly don't spend hours a day looking at them. And I was like, they got to come down. And one night my daughter and I just came in and ripped them down. <laughs> I, so I, I was like, it made me want to redecorate a few pieces of my house, but I'm looking at it in the background constantly. Yeah, right. Um, you know, were, were there any other big decisions in the firm that you were heavily involved in to the level? I mean, I imagine that in your leadership role, you're involved in all the decisions, right? right. So, um, you know, one of the decisions um, was um, whether we would apply for a PPP loan. And, I, and we were, management committee, we were probably talking daily, you know, at least three times a week. And um, what, should we apply for it, should we not? And ultimately, you know, the PPP loan allowed us to avoid laying people off. Without yeah. that, we might have been in a position where we would have, you know, followed a lot of firms and furloughed people. And, and that really has allowed us not to do that. And so it's a decision that everyone had to get comfortable with. Um, and so that, that was a big decision. I think the whole PPP discussion application process. So those, those are the big things. And then the things yeah. that we used to think were big things now don't look so big, you know? The, the, the routine things we talk about every Friday on our management committee call seem sure. very routine now. They're no longer the, the huge thing. Um, it's nice right. to get back to talking about the mundane. Yeah, your perspective really changes. And mm, for sure. You know, what seems like a lot isn't so much anymore. Right, exactly, exactly. Definitely. Um, so how has your practice been impacted? I know you've been busy. Yeah. The first three weeks, um, the muni market just shut down. You couldn't sell um, uh, any obligations in the muni market. And then the Federal Reserve jumped in and did a lot of things to stabilize the muni market and to stabilize the credit markets in generally resulting in historic low rates. So when rates are low and you're a public finance lawyer, everybody wants to borrow. And because they don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow, they wanna to borrow immediately. So we find ourselves in a position where, I think we're busier than we've been in the 35 years that I've been practicing law, um, just crazy busy with a challenge that we're not in the office, we're not together, we can't sit around in small groups as easily as we did to figure things out. And sure. one of the biggest challenges we had, and, and this all this credit goes to Melissa Bennett, Joanne Kilmer, Aaron Kaiser, Amanda Morabito, Sharon Brown, is we closed a deal for DASME that had 53 borrowers. Wow. And the amount of due diligence that they sent in that we organized without paper. And then they sent in closing documents. that we sent in, you know, stacks of closing documents that had to be reviewed. And, and Kelly Nathan and a ton of legend in there, and in an amazing way, and it, it was really the list of organizational skills working with Joanne, it got done maybe even more efficiently than when we were in the office. It, 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 it was amazing, and I was only involved from the distance, and um, mm -hmm. 
it shows that, you know, what people can do when they have a challenge and they figured it out. There was a lot of talk and thought about how to do it and they figured it out and, and made it happen in a way that was amazing. Yeah, it's really amazing. And I think it, in particular in the type of work that you do, I one of the first things I think about in these big deals, right, is like paper and the amount of documents. And, you know, I will never forget the first time I saw you folks with one of your closing meetings, right? And I walked past the conference room and there was just like the row of files, like little file right. folders all in a line. I thought it was hilarious because I like, love organizations. It's like that is excellent. But just the sheer amount right. of it is really jarring when that's not what you do, right? So I have no experience in this and I don't, it's not the kind of law I practice, so I don't know what to expect, but I expect there's papers and documents, right? Um, right. So, so that. it was, um, you know, luckily the office had reopened, so the 53 borrowers who sent us hard copies, because we needed hard copies, we couldn't take a scan of $10 million of the bonds here and $40 million of the bonds there. So the office had reopened and Aaron, you know, in the flexibility that people need to have, went into the office one day, shut herself in one of the copy rooms and I, one day, I think it was like three days and scanned her heart out to Joanne and then uploaded everything on SharePoint. So everyone who was all over the state that needed to review yeah. the doc sign documents could go on our SharePoint site and who signed documents. Yeah. Well, interesting like tidbits is that we close a vast majority of our our deals especially for our state or for our local issuers towns counties school districts through an entity called depository trust company and so mm -hmm. you get the bonds you check them out and then you send them to them and you never see them again and they shut that function down and they oh, say wow. you keep bonds you send us a piece of paper that says you have them and you keep them so joanne kimmer was sitting on tens hundreds of millions of dollars of bonds in her house no because they really wouldn't be able to do much with them even though they're registered obligations they're registered to DTC but like floods and fires and like oh, yeah, and, scary. But, and finally DTC opened up um, I think it was June 24th and Joanne has been sending you know slowly but surely going through the files and sending him the, the bonds but she said the other day she they're finally all gone and she's very relieved because she was waking up in the middle of the night worried that something would happen to them. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just like pressure. Right, right. Yeah. And it was with the trust, right? So, you know, a school district's going to issue $10 million worth of bonds, and we're sitting there with the paper, and some purchaser, an underwriter, bought the bonds. They send $10 million to the school district on the say that Joanne's got the bonds in her house. I mean, we scan them to them, but, you know, they, there was yeah. a lot of trust, and it shows that, you know, a group of people have worked together for years. Everybody trusted the system would work and, you know, knock on what it has. Sure. And also, not for nothing, like, what other choice do you have? It, it, none, because they just shut down. Yeah. That You know, they they didn't want UPS drivers coming into their facility, you know, hundreds or thousands a day, and they, their people were working remotely, so there's no one there to process. And I think from their health and safety point of view, they said, we got to make this work a different way. And they had done that in 9-11, but for like three or four days. Right. Not, three, not three months. So. Yeah. I think that's one thing about this that has been, that is really shocking for me is the guy started working from home a little bit before the executive order. And um, I did not anticipate the length of time that I would be home. Uh, I thought, you know, a couple weeks maybe. But on Sissico, my gosh. You know, and, um, you know I, I'm, I talk to people all over the firm all the time. And so, you know, I think there was tremendous stress when we first went home because, frankly, people didn't know if, like, the virus was really going to take over upstate and we were going to have the same situation they had in New York. And then people settled into a, a routine. But I'm finding that, like, post-4th of July when people realize, wow, this really is going to be months and months more there's another level of stress that we haven't seen in a while that are starting and maybe it's different but it's people coming to the realization you did like where's the end you know when is yeah. life back to normal when am i going to go to the office without a mask and without having to walk in a certain direction and not wash my hands every time i touch something a while and i think people are coming to that realization and i think that's another sort of inflection point in this um, mm -hmm. pandemic. 
Yeah. I'm hopeful that we just like as a society and as a culture adopt some better practices in general from this. So for example, I've been thinking a lot about other countries that already have a mask culture. So sometimes you get a cold and you like have to go to work still, or you have to go do things. Right. Groceries, right? So like maybe people wear a mask now. Right. Because not that foreign to us anymore. It's not a weird thing. Right. You know, we're getting more used to it. And I think why, why wouldn't you? Right. Do that? Um, it seems like the reasonable thing to do and to protect those around you, uh, you know, just flu season or, you know, well, especially now we know how effective masks can be. Right. Why would you not, you know, why yeah. not have a, and, and now everyone's got a stack of their favorite masks everywhere. You know, it's like mm -hmm. my cheater glasses. There's one in every room. I've got them in every pocket in my car. Why wouldn't you do that um, going yeah. forward? I mean, you know? can you imagine, like, if every person in Manhattan who had a cold on the subway wore a mask? Oh, my gosh. You'd probably cut, the, good, right? like, you'd, you'd cut down you know? the transmission of clothes and flu, flu too, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I and yeah, I, I agree. We're, we're going to learn a lot from this. Um, interesting. Once, you know, once we get beyond this, I think we'll learn a lot. But, I, I, you know, I was thinking, 4th of July was sort of my turning point. I started going out a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not really going. I don't know where I'm going, but, you know, it feels like I'm out more. And I just, before my mask marriage was, was just run to the supermarket, come home, take it off. I was out a little more over the fourth, and I just think we all need to get used to you can have a normal life and wear a mask all the time. You know, leaving yeah. your mask on for extended periods. We just have to get used to that as a thing. I'm still not mm -hmm. there yet. I still feel uncomfortable in my mask, and um, but I, I'm, I'm a, I'm, it's, I, I think it's important to wear them. I'm, I'm a big believer in better safe than sorry. Yeah, I'm a big smiler. So, like, if someone holds a door, like, you know, to acknowledge someone who lets me pass, I smile at them. Right. And a lot of I realize now that afterwards, I'm like, oh, I have they missed. Did. They did not well, notice at all. They didn't realize. The I, other day, I, I was going to go and say thank you. <laughs> and I put on, like, some lip gloss. And my daughter's like, you're going to put a mask on. No one's ever going to see that lip gloss. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it just was like a habit. I was going out, I threw some on. She's like, yeah. You don't need to do that. It didn't even occur to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. I'm a natural thing. So, yeah. yeah. It takes some getting used to, you know? Because you always be like smiling at people to acknowledge them or you see them. Yeah. And you, now it's going to have to be words or a shake of the head or something that to get the yeah. same point across. Definitely. Are there, what do you think are the challenges that the firm faces going forward? Um, I think, you know, it's still challenging to see what our clients, how much of an impact this is going to have on our clients, um, to keep people feeling connected to the firm when they're sitting in their homes. That's mm -hmm. a really big one because it's the glue that has always made us successful. It's the personal relationships that people develop, not just within an office, but cross offices through our retreats and our Cooperstown events and, you know, PA meetings that we're not going to have. And so we have to make sure we're really working hard on office calls and associate calls and individual calls with people to stay that glue. So that's a big concern, clients, the glue. And then, um, you know, bringing in new associates. Like I've, you know, welcomed a few new associates to the firm during this pandemic. How hard is that? You know, you're starting a new yeah. firm and you're sitting at home. We have our summer associates who, who have started, some of them in the office, some sitting at home. That's going to be very difficult for them to bond. You know, think about when you were summer associates and you bonded with the people that were part of your group. Mm -hmm. You know, how is that bonding going to take place when this is all they get to do? Yeah, so, definitely. It's, yeah, it's, and, you know, and a big part of my transition was I had intended to spend most of this year traveling. So my husband had some surgery at the beginning of the year. March 1st was going to be my kickoff date. I had a whole plan of where I was going to be every week across the firm. And, you know, I, I canceled it, you know, early because I kind of saw this coming and I didn't want to be traveling around, bring the virus to somebody or bring the virus home. So right. that's a challenge for me is um, that really has put sort of a crimp in my transition plan of, of spending more time in other offices because I don't know when I'll get to do that again. 
Yeah, that makes sense. So, so like, there's there's more there's some, some challenges, um, you know, financial and, and, and the glue piece and all of that. So I think like everybody, we just don't know what's around the corner. And we're yeah. going to have to just be patient and sort of take it one wave at a time. Definitely. Are there any parts in particular of your experience um, with this pandemic that you hope stick with the um, firm? I think people have been very kind to one another. I've seen a lot of examples of just kindness. This place has always been a place that I think work-wise, we've had each other's backs. You know, when I, mm -hmm. when I had a problem, I always felt very supported by my colleagues and I hope my colleagues felt the same. But I've seen just like personal act of kindness. I think that's important. I think um, people have connected with their children in a way they hadn't in a long time. And I sure. hope they, even though it's been intense and I don't know how people with young children are doing it, but there's some of that that I hope we can still manage to find. You know, when people say they haven't, you know, had dinner with their families every night and ever. Mm -hmm. Part of that was work. Part of that was, you know, children being involved in activities. But I hope we can that, I hope people can find that time to do their personal life, whatever that will be, um, even when we return to the office. And I think they will because they've gotten a taste of it. So I think yeah. they'll, they'll hold on to those good parts tightly. Definitely. Yeah, I even was on the recipient end of a pers of an act of kindness, which I very much appreciated um, from some of the associates in the Albany office. I had was going through some personal things, and um, one day on my front porch, just turned up like like treats and uh, oh. like just things and a card with like messages from all a whole bunch of different people. It's like really really kind. Um, and it speaks a lot about the culture. Of right. the firm. In addition to the, you know, the circumstances of, of the events, you know, right. it's time. This is tough for everyone. And I think people are supporting each other in really good ways. And I think that's really lovely. Yeah, I do too. I, I, I think that's great about the Albany Associates. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, I think we have a great group of people in the Albany office. Um, and I think that's always been sort of the atmosphere. I attribute it back to when Ned Trombley was the managing director and the atmosphere he set and still there today. It's a very supportive place. So, you know, there'll be some good things that will come out of this um, for sure. Um, and we just have to, you know, work on or keep working at it. I think it's a daily thing. It's a daily effort to try to connect with people across the firm. It's just so important for the future of the firm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, any, is there any, uh, any particular like words of advice or anything that you would want to tell another lawyer who's in a leadership position or working in public finance, the, uh, going, spinning in circles right now? Or? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know that I have any advice. I don't know that I, you know, have the skill set to provide advice to other people, but I do think what, what I've learned through this or reminded, cause I think I really already knew it is that people are capable of so much. And when you put a challenge in front of them, at every level of the firm, people stepped up and figured out how to make it work. And sure. it's like the human spirit's gonna survive no matter what. And people people can step up in times of challenge. And, and our people have stepped up in amazing ways. And when you think about that, a firm of 500 didn't miss a beat. You know, there wasn't a day where we didn't have access or two days when you couldn't get a check or a day when you couldn't process a bill. But not a day that this firm didn't function just as they did when in their office. It's an amazing tribute to our admin team, to our lawyers, and everyone, really. Yeah, I would agree. Well, thank you so very much for taking the time to chat with me. I appreciate it. I'm sure, uh, you know, this will be a good addition to the documentation of this pandemic and you know well, this very weird time yeah, well thank you and you know I, I if you ever want to go into like news reporting you're a great <laughs> you did a great job <laughs> wonderful all right i appreciate that see you in the yeah, office you too. Right, bye -bye. thanks so much bye